Well, greetings, saints. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're prospering in the Lord. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you in this video our plans to make changes in the COVID protocols for the coming season. Uh, in January, I really felt in my heart uh, that we needed to consider transition, transition uh, out of the existing protocols into a new approach. And that's gonna be what I'm gonna be sharing with you uh, in this video. Before I do that, I wanna just share a few reflections on the past year. After I share about our approach to COVID protocols, I then want to take some time and share some scripture that's really been important for us during the past season and I think is going to continue to be important for us as we move forward. This deals with how we as believers should respond to the governor's executive orders, a really, really important topic. So first of all, just some uh, reflections on the past year. Um, you know, all of us have been impacted, not in all the same way, but all of us have in, been impacted uh, by the, uh, the pandemic, uh, and so Certainly all of us have felt the strain. In spite of that, uh, God's been moving. Uh, we can really all, I think, be thankful for ways in which we've seen God move. I know around the first of the year, as the churches were gathering to reflect on the previous year, there were a lot of great testimonies of things God, God has done that he did in 2020, and I'm, I'm confident he's been continuing in 2021. Having said that, the strain, the uh, pandemic, and the protocols has placed on us is really, uh, it's really pretty big. Uh, first of all, a number of you have struggled with uh, the COVID virus um, and, uh, you know, that that's significant. Uh, in particular, our dear brother, Rick Crisitello, who passed away earlier this week, uh, he was hospitalized for several weeks. He tested positive for COVID and died as a result of the complications. Uh, hearts go out to the Crisitello family. I know there have been economic challenges for a lot of you. That's big. Um, there's been for many a, a sense of, you know, the distance. Uh, uh, you know, social uh, social distancing is social distancing, a sense of, of distancing, and that's hard on us with respect to family and friends. And uh, on top of that, we have wrestled through theological issues at times, and that's that's been significant. Uh, if for no other reason, then we don't always have a agreement on exactly how to respond to the protocols. And I'm going to be addressing that uh, in the third part of the video. But for now, let me just say that while COVID has put a stress on us, overall, I see the a depth in the people of God that really, really is inspiring. I want to encourage you to uh, continue in your love for the Lord, love for the brethren. Uh, let's be kind to one another, patient to one another. I was thinking of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 earlier today. It says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Saints, let's be extra diligent uh, in this season to ask the Holy Spirit's help in being gracious to one another as we continue to wrestle with things uh, pandemic related. Um, now, the new protocols. As I mentioned already, I believe this is, is to be a time of transition. A lot has changed since we adopted the protocols we did last, last summer. Um, we know more about the COVID virus. We know who's at risk, at high risk for uh, serious effects of COVID. Uh, the number of cases in our county is way down after the November, December, January spike. Um, many people are receiving the vaccine. Um, we know a lot more now about the negative impact of the protocols and the Im negative impact they're having on our spiritual lives. Uh, they greatly affect our worship, our fellowship, our ministry and prayer together, the Lord's Supper, water baptism, our outreach. Um, even if they don't prevent us completely, they certainly hinder some of our core activities. Uh, we know a lot more about the negative impact of protocols on emotional health. That's a big thing uh, in the news uh, lately. And quite frankly, it's been eight months since we set up the protocols. We knew they were temporary measures at the time, temporary in light of the emergency, and it's time to transition into a new season. In order to make that transition, in order to navigate, uh, we're gonna be implementing a new approach to the protocols. Rather than following one set of protocols across the board in all the churches, we'll be relying on the pastors and elders of each church to make important decisions for each congregation separately. Uh, there are four components to our approach. I'm gonna first read them, then share a few thoughts regarding each one. Number one, we will continue to urge everyone to be well-informed and to use wisdom regarding their own health 
and their attendance at meetings. Number two, we'll continue to regularly stream weekly services. If individuals are unable to attend in person, please join us via video and continue to stay in touch with your pastor. Number three, at some of our gatherings, but not all, we will continue to ask for specific health-related practices to be followed. When we do, we will be clear regarding what, what health-related practices are being asked of those present at the gatherings. And then number four, the pastors and elders of each church location will make decisions regarding the pro protocols for the gatherings at their respective locations during the upcoming season. But I wanna thank the pastors and elders really for investing themselves tire tirelessly during this past year. Brothers, thank you. I wanna say thank you as well to your families. Uh, your families have sacrificed a lot in, in, in the way you've given your time. And in a sense, they've, they've given up for the cause of the gospel. So these four things, I wanna comment on each of them. Number one, we will continue to urge everyone to be well informed and to use wisdom regarding their own health and their attendance at meetings. Our general approach through the years with any kind of hazard is to encourage each of you to be aware of the situation and make wise decisions. We rarely make changes or even cancel services, whether it's the seasonal flu, a blizzard, or some other hazard. Uh, we want you uh, to, to make whatever decision you think is best regarding travel or attendance or other precautions. If you have concerns about any of these things, we urge you to make wise decisions. It's not fear or unbelief to use wisdom. Proverbs chapter 22, verse three says this, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. And so as we continue to face the COVID pandemic, please exercise caution, the cautions you feel are important. Although the number of new cases each day in St. Lawrence County is going down generally, uh, we are still dealing with the virus and it's still a serious disease. Number two, uh, we'll continue to regularly stream weekly services. If individuals are unable to attend in person, please join us via video and continue to stay in touch with your pastor. Now, live streaming is not the same as being there. Uh, I know that. Zoom gatherings are good, but they're not like meeting in person. I, I know that. Uh, but they are helpful ways for us to stay connected and to build up and encourage one another. So if you can't be with us uh, in person, uh, certainly join us online. Number three, at some of our gatherings, but not all, we will continue to ask for specific health-related practices to be followed. When we do, we'll be clear regarding what health-related practices are being asked of those present at the gatherings. Now, in some of the churches, there may not be any immediate changes uh, from the current protocols. In other churches, there will be changes pretty immediately. For example, beginning April 4th, the Potsdam Church is planning to hold two services each Sunday morning, each with a different set of protocols. So uh, anticipate that there will be changes, uh, different pace in each church. Uh, number four, the pastors and elders of each church location will make decisions regarding the protocols for the gatherings at their respective locations during the upcoming season. Now, this is very significant. The protocols that we, that we put in place for all the churches across the board by all of the pastors and elders will be replaced by protocols that the local church pastors and elders determine. Each location will set up an approach that will work best for their local church body as they come together for worship and other meetings. What this looks like in Canton may be different from Madrid, which may be different from Richville, which may be different from Moira, which may be different from Potsdam. And these approaches may change along the way depending on a variety of things. If the circumstances change, uh, we will make adjustments as needed. Um, and I should mention, because the protocols uh, might be different from church to church, when you visit other church locations, be aware that their approach may be different from your own home church and be respectful 
of that. You know, one of the things I've tried to do during this pandemic is to be polite. If an individual or a church or a business owner requests that I wear a mask, I try to I try to honor that. So, um, so that's how we're going to be approaching the protocols. I hope that's clear. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me or one of the pastors. Now, I want to pivot into this third portion because I want to talk about how we can fulfill the call of God on our lives uh, to still honor, to honor those in authority uh, as we walk these things out. Uh, one of the issues that has been a topic of considerable discussion for us as believers throughout this pandemic deals with our relationship to those in authority. Um, I want to address this topic because I want us to be empowered to move forward in making healthy decisions so that we're ready to support one another in the decisions, even if we might not agree entirely. Now I wanna start by posing two questions, questions that illustrate how very differently two people could view the issues. Number one, if the governor gives us an executive order, shouldn't our response be as simple and straightforward as a sincere and polite, yes, sir? Number two, if the governor gives us an executive order regarding things that hinder our conduct as believers in worship, fellowship, prayer, the Lord's Supper, water baptism, the way we greet one another, shouldn't we respectfully disobey the order and do what God says anyway? Interesting questions. Now, depending on which question you think is more important, you'll arrive at very different conclusions. Now, these questions are really helpful for us to dive into this topic, and the answer to the issue is more complicated than either of those questions imply. There's a tension because each question points to something that we would call good, and there are many factors involved that need to be considered. Now, going back to our annual meeting in November, we talked about the protocols and, uh, and how we developed them. At that time, we shared with you that there are quite a few things that we evaluated in uh, putting together the protocols. Um, I talked firstly about the foundation we have, our call to honor the Lord and in, in everything we do, and our mandate to teach and preach the gospel. That's foundational, uh, that is central to everything we do. And then we talked about a number of things that we considered in putting the protocols together. The biblical injunction to honor those in authority. The impact of the protocols on our lives and their impact on our ability to fulfill the mandate. The legal and financial cost of our decision. Concerns about COVID and the health of members and others. The impact of our approach on other church members. And finally, the impact of our example on our own families and those in the community. Uh, further, we went on and we talked uh, at that annual meeting about what had been recently set in to the governor's executive orders as a limit on the number of people you could have in private gatherings in your own home. And I, and I took the same protocol paradigm of questions um, and uh, the grid work, and I applied it to our decisions for how we as, as individuals might apply this. And so I talked about our foundational mandate to show hospitality. Uh, that is a biblical value uh, that we place high regard on. But then the next questions are the biblical injunction to honor those in authority. We now have a, an executive order saying we can only have 10 people in the home in a private gathering, um, uh, you know, and, and so that, that puts a, a limit, especially if you're a family of eight, nine, 10 people. Um, the impact of protocols on our lives and their impact, impact on our ability to fulfill the mandate. The legal and financial cost of our decision. Concerns about COVID and the health of members and others. The impact of our approach on other church members. The impact of our example on our own families and those in the community. And what we shared then was that uh, these are not simple uh, one-dimensional questions. They really do need to be examined very, very carefully and very, very prayerfully. It isn't as simple as saying, 
if the governor gives us an executive order, uh, shouldn't our response be as simple and straightforward as a sincere and polite yes, sir? Nor is it if the governor gives us an executive order regarding things that hinder our conduct as believers in worship, fellowship, prayer, the Lord's Supper, water baptism, and the way we greet one another, shouldn't we respectfully do what God says anyway? Um, there's a complexity to it. To help unpack this, I wanna make three short statements, and these will help provide an outline uh, for examining this topic, and they'll provide a good outline for your further study. The three short, short statements are these. Number one, there are times when we should obey those in authority. Number two, there are times when we should disobey those in authority. And then number three, there are times when there is liberty for us to make judgment calls, times when we may choose to obey or choose to disobey depending on the particulars of the circumstance. Now let me unpack those a little bit. Number one, there are times when we should obey those in authority. As a general rule, this is where we should start. As much as possible, obey those in positions of civil government. This is our default posture. I want to read from Romans chapter 13 and also 1 Peter chapter 2. Significant Bible verses that help define this default posture. Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resist the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not, are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Romans 13, one through seven, and 1 Peter chapter two, verses 13 through 17. Now, I may not like the laws, they may interfere with my life, uh, they may even cost me something like, like taxes, although uh, many of you seem to be getting back more than you're putting in these days. Um, but the general approach, uh, when the policeman says pull over, you pull over. Unless the word of God speaks to the subject, we generally comply. That's very, very significant. That's our default posture. Number two, there are times when we should disobey those in authority. A good example, example of this in the scripture would be that of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter three. Uh, when they were commanded uh, to bow down and worship the golden image, they would not do it. In fact, the king gave them a second chance to obey, and they declined. Here's what they said. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And so we see a clear example here of a time when they disobeyed the king and the king's edict, and rightfully so. 
Number three, there are times when there is liberty for us to make judgment calls, times when we may choose to obey or choose to disobey obey, depending on the particulars of the circumstance. Uh, this can occur when the call of God upon us as believers is somehow hindered by civil authority, even if it's not entirely stopped. And when that happens, we are facing what we might call competing goods, when two good things are in conflict. Let me explain this idea of competing goods or two good things in conflict uh, by using something contained in the present executive orders. The executive orders restrict us to private gatherings in our homes of no more than 10 persons unless they are members of the immediate household. So good thing number one, it's good to obey the government when they speak into matters of public health. That's actually a good thing. But good thing number two, it's a good thing to obey the biblical command to show hospitality. That's a good thing. How do we navigate these competing goods. One believer might say, you know, the executive order restricting the gatherings in homes is just for a season. It'll be over soon enough. Let's just obey. Another might say, but God speaks to us clearly regarding hospitality. And we're told in the Bible that the time is short. I don't believe that I should yield to the government in this matter, given that biblical mandate and the fact that the time is short. And these two might take very different approaches to this particular, their response to this particular mandate. The important thing we need to understand is this. It's not sin to obey the government in this mandate. The order is meant for the overall good of the community. It's temporary and many believers will choose to obey this order. But it's not sin to disobey the government. There's a higher law, and so many believers will choose to disobey uh, this order. How do we resolve this? For the one who says, the governor has commanded me to have no more than 10 persons in my home at any time except for immediate household members, therefore I can't in good conscience exceed 10 persons in my home, I would encourage that person to pray, give careful consideration of the matter, and do in faith and a good conscience what is in his heart to do. And for the one who says, the word of God speaks explicitly to our call to be hospitable, and the time is short. In good conscience, I will exceed the 10 person limit in my home for the sake of fulfilling my call. I would similarly encourage that person to pray, give careful consideration of the matter, and do in faith and a good conscience what is in his heart to do. Even though they are making completely different decisions, I would encourage them both. Furthermore, for the one who says, I will not exceed 10 persons, I would tell him that there may be consequences to his decision. There may be kingdom opportunities that he will miss. That's big. For the one who says, I will exceed 10 persons. I will tell him there may be consequences to his decision, and he may be fined by the government. The key is this, when faced with competing goods, the answers aren't always as simple as we must obey or we must disobey. And, we're, and when we're faced with that, we must give one another space to make decisions without condemning each other for the decisions we make. Now I want to address this from a Romans 14 perspective because the New Testament addresses the very thing we're talking about in Romans 14. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says regarding a difference of conscience or sincerely held position regarding issues of worship. In Romans chapter 14, verse 5, you should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Now, he's, he's talking about issues that are uh, issues of conscience. And instead of settling the issues of worship and other things mentioned in Romans 14 by saying this is the right way, this is the wrong way, the Apostle Paul lays out a critical foundation for believers walking through the challenges of personal conscience by making decisions out of faith and personal conviction. Later in that chapter, 
Paul underscores the importance of us not judging one another in these matters, but recognizing that we will all be judged by the Lord in these matters. Verse 10, so why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Continuing, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. You know, when we have differences of conscience, it's very easy to look at others and say, how could you possibly think that way? How could you possibly do that? What's wrong with you? Um, and a lot of times when there are these competing goods, we have to be very careful to refrain from judging one another. Now, uh, I wanna say something very briefly here because it's related um, uh, and I'll, I'll be brief. There are times when the Bible speaks clearly and emphatically to issues and there are no competing goods. In those cases, we need to judge righteous judgment. Judge in a way that is consistent with the scriptures. Let me give you an example. If someone says to me, even though I'm involved in adultery or some other sexual sin, you shouldn't judge me. Romans 14 says, don't be, you know, judge and condemn. Actually, I should judge. The Bible is very clear on this. It's not my personal judgment. It's the judgment of the Word of God. So we have to be careful with this. There's a common misunderstanding on this, and you'll hear it floated about a lot. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. You shouldn't judge, that kind of thing. There's a right time to judge according to the Word of God. But in the matter of the executive orders, let me continue now with the, the main idea. We're dealing with the matter of the executive orders. We're dealing with restrictions on activities that are at the center of our worship and our communion. Deciding how to respond is going to be difficult, and we need to give each other space in these issues. Now, saints, I share all of this to help you understand, firstly, how we have processed decisions as a church, but secondly, to help you process your decisions as individuals and as families. Now, what I've shared is just an outline. Uh, there's a lot to process on this topic. Uh, I look forward to us growing deeper and understanding how to approach these kinds of issues with even greater clarity. I know some of the pastors uh, plan to follow uh, my sharing up with some teaching on Romans 14. Uh, and this is significant because I believe that in the coming days, we'll be facing these kinds of issues more and more. Um, in some ways, I believe God is using what we've been through in this pandemic to get us ready, to get us sharper in an understanding of the Word of God in a way that's gonna be significant for the days ahead. Saints, God bless you. Um, may the Lord prosper you in the days to come. And uh, may Jesus be glorified. And our cry is, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen, God bless you.